All right, uh, welcome everyone today. My name is uh, Jus Siegel. I'm the chief curator and director of programming at the Wendy Museum. And uh, a special welcome, of course, to our speaker today, and Nimetz. Um, yeah, historically speaking, um, a lot of artworks have been inspired by science and also a lot of science has been uh, inspired by artwork and continues to be so, which was actually the motivation this year for the special project funded by the Getty Foundation, uh, PST Art, with the topic Art and Science Collide. It's a larger project where about 50 Southern Californian institutions participate in. We are one of them. We are doing an exhibition this fall called Counter Slash Surveillance about uh, surveillance technology from the Cold War period with a focus on facial recognition technology. Uh, we uh, put these materials in a global context and we invited 16 artists to um, share artwork in which they assess or historicize or appropriate or subvert in any way the original uh, uh, surveillance or facial recognition technologies. Another um, uh, item where we cross boundaries between art and science is our fall 2025 exhibition, Visions of the Cosmos, watching the, or interpreting this, the sky in East and West, where uh, we work together with um, uh, artists and astrophysicists. And uh, finally, um, I have to mention the current um, lecture series which was initiated by our Council of Advisors member, Skip Victor. Unfortunately, he can't be, uh, be with us today, but he came up with the idea to organize a section or a series called Art Across Boundaries, which is about artwork and artists working uh, on, in the field of um, applied technologies and uh, experimenting with new um, configurations of art. Uh, the series started as a collaboration with uh, the medical department at Stanford University. The first uh, couple of lectures were held at Stanford. This is the first iteration at the Wendy Museum. And I'm very happy that it starts with an artist uh, who is so accomplished and has such an original approach to art is in Anne Niemetz. So I'm happy to uh, briefly introduce her. Um, Anne Niemetz is a media artist and designer working in the fields of wearable technology, breaking boundaries between costume design, fashion and technology. She works on interactive installation and audiovisual design. She is particularly fascinated by the convergence of art, science, design, and technology, and she pursues collaborative and cross-disciplinary projects. Other import important recurring themes in her work are the role of gender in technology and the democratization of technology. Anne's projects have been exhibited in, uh, and this is not a complete list, New Zealand, Hong Kong, Austria, Germany, France, Belgium, the Netherlands, Chile, the United States, including the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. And Anne holds a media arts degree from the Staatliche Hochschule für Gestaltung in Karlsruhe, Germany, with a focus in digital media and interactive sound installation and an MFA in Design Media Arts from the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA. Since 2007, she has been living and working in New Zealand, where she holds the position of Senior Lecturer in the Media Design Program at Victoria University in Wellington. So uh, please give a warm welcome to Anne Nimetz. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for that warm, warm welcome and thank you to everyone who made this lecture series possible. Now just before I start, I would like to mention that uh, the action will be on the screen. So if you want to reposition yourself now so you can see the screen better, please do so. We can take a moment for that to happen because um, I have stuff to show you. So. For today, I've selected four of my past works to show you that address the topic of art across boundaries in different ways. And before I discuss these works, I will give, give you a short introduction over my background 
And to finish the talk, I will show you what I'm currently working on, so my work in progress. The thread that follows through my talk, and it's a very loose thread, is noisy creations. Can I just check, is the sound fine? Is it good volume? Yeah? All right. So um, I already got this lovely introduction, but just a little bit about my background. For the most part, I grew up in Germany. My father is German and my mother is American. In fact, she's from San Diego, not far from here. And um, I've lived in New Zealand for 17 years, and that would explain the accent, so if, just in case you were wondering. Um, as a youngster, I painted and played in bands, so my interest in audiovisual expression goes all the way back to my childhood. And when I then went to university to study media arts, I got into video and audio design, interactive installation, multimedia performance, and all things digital media. In 2002, I left Germany to move here to LA to do a master's at the Design Media Arts Department at UCLA. During my studies, my supervisor, Professor Vesna, raised my interest in two particular areas one being wearable technology, and the other being the broader area of art and science collaboration. I went on to finish my master's with a project titled The Dark Side of the Cell, which is one of the works I will talk about later today. After a few years in LA, I applied for an academic job in New Zealand at Victoria University of Wellington, and I have been working there ever since. At Victoria School of Design, I teach courses in audiovisual design, physical computing, and wearable technology. And as I mentioned, I've been there for quite a long time already. Time flies. So that's just a bit about my background. Um, many of my creative projects are collaborative, and I think media art is a perfect place for connecting art and science, design and technology. In general, my goal is not only to share my fascinations, observations, captivations as an artist, but to create rich and meaningful sensory experiences for audiences. So the first uh, project I want to show you is from over 20 years ago. It is titled Subtract, and it was a collaboration with the computer scientist Holger Förderer. So, the philosopher Paul Virilio challenges his readers to imagine the airspace that surrounds us as solid matter and names this airspace negative space. Architects tend to be well acquainted with this imagined reversal of spaces through the subtractive building con concept. This installation was also informed by my investigations of how people traverse spaces they w the way they do for instance, the strange phenomena that people prefer following given paths instead of taking the shortest route. And you see that on here, the snow-covered ground. This was a photo I took from my room. Um, there is actually another path here, but because nobody walked it, people would just you know, go around here. So that's sort of one of the first observations that um, I had when I went into developing this project. Uh, and our usage of space is a mixture of practicality and mostly subconscious decisions, uh, also, for example, avoiding the center of large open spaces. Now, subtract puts the theory of negative space in relation to white noise. White noise is a signal that comprises all frequencies at equal intensity. Theoretically, white noise is perfectly random, but in practice, white noise created by a synthesizer isn't quite perfectly random, which is why I added the word theoretically here. Not that we would be able to tell the difference with our ears. Um, a sign tone is a pure tone that occupies one single frequency, uh, which we can see here. So you could say that these two are opposites. You have the sign tone, and then you have the white noise. And pretty much everything else uh, all other sounds are something in between. And this was the theory that I used for the design, sound design of the installation. And also one of the reasons why I uh, titled this uh, talk Noisy Creations. So as white noise includes all frequencies, I think of it as an acoustic sculpting material from which I can subtract frequencies to arrive at a specific tone. Just like a sculptor subtracts material from a block to extract, extract the form of desire. And that was the underlying concept. 
So Subtract was initially developed to be installed in the university where I did my undergraduate studies. And I just wanted to give you a sense of the space and the scale of this building, which is why I put these pictures there. Um, it's a very long building, and inside there are a lot of these large uh, open hall spaces next to, next to each other. The installation occupied two of three halls, and in one space there was a camera hung high up in the ceiling so I could survey the movement in the space if there was anybody walking in the space. And I installed a sonic feedback to the movement, so if there is movement, you would hear a sound. Now there is another space, um, which was an enclosed space with a big screen that would um, display this, a um, three-dimensional version of the negative space of this. And the sound design in this space was made in an additive way, so an opposite way, so to say. Um, it will become clearer when I show the video. So the fact that this installation is split into two rooms, meaning the visitor cannot see their movement when they're in the observation space, allows the heightening of awareness of movement, people going back and forth. And so um, first they would get the acoustic feedback in one space, then later on discover the visual representation of the space, and then often go back to see if they could navigate the space in a way that would uh, create the shape in the projection. So I believe now I'll show you the video of the first showing. the space grows closed again, as if there was new snowfall, perhaps. So my collaborator and I um, installed the camera in the ceiling a week before the installation was set up so we could observe the, the difference in movement in space. And on the left side, you see um, the average, uh, an image of the average movement in space where you see the dark spots are hardly touched. And then with installing the sound feedback, a much more even exploration of the space. I'll show you one more video. So this uh, installation was shown several times and I think in, the, in this version we might have uh, done a better job at presenting the negative space landscape. Um, and this was in uh, Santiago de Chile and I do think that the audience was uh, slightly more playful there as well. <laughs> Sorry, I need to go backwards. The
coming. Come on. The next project I'd like to show you is titled The Dark Side of the Cell and this was my master's graduation project and this time I got to explore a very different type of noise. Through my supervisor Professor Vesna I met the biochemist Andrew Pelling who at the time was a postgraduate student exploring the sound of cells. We decided to together create the first concert and installation featuring, sound of, featuring the sounds of biological cells ever. When I met Andrew, the discovery of sounding cells was not yet accepted in the scientific community. Reviewers of the cell sound paper called the experiments nonsense at the time, which shows the dominance of the image, the visual proof, and science. But to me as artists, sounding cells were absolutely fascinating. And meanwhile, the cell sound research has been acknowledged in the scientific community and has been published, for example, in the renowned science magazine. So the first cells that were listened to were yeast cells. They're very large, they're the guinea pigs of uh, biochemists. And with the help of the atomic force microscope, an oscillation on the surface of the living cell can be detected. And this vibration can be listened to. It's pretty much the most direct way to experience this uh, vibration. And surprisingly, the frequency of this tiny vibration in the nanoscale turns out to be within the human hearing range and is in fact a sound that is merely amplified vibration, not modified in any way. So I'll play uh, two very distinct uh, cell sounds to you. One of a healthy yeast cell that will be about a thousand hertz. I'll turn down the sound a bit. Sorry. And here is a cancerous cell, which will sound a lot like white noise. So, the Dark Side of the Cell project is both a concert and an installation. Andrew and I built sculptures that we could project imagery of cells onto. The inspiration of these structures are the cytoskeletons of cells. The cytoskeletons of cells are robust structures very similar to tensegrity structures. Tensegrity stands for tensional integrity and relies on the interplay of tension and compression. The sculptor Kenneth Snelson uses the pre-stressed geometrical version of the tensegrity principle. Uh, but unlike Snelson's work, the dark side of the cell sculptures are constructed according to an asymmetrical version of the tensegrity principle, so very irregular, which is closest to the irregular biological structure of a cell. We stretched a semi-translucent skin over the structures. The skin is translucent enough to reveal the scaffolding structures, but at the same time allows the surface to show projected images. So here's a photo of the spatial setup at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. 
and ceiling installed projectors projected still footage and videos of singing cells and their sonograms onto the sculptural elements from above. The dark side of the cell concert is comprised of five separate movements. We composed using the raw recording of cells, refraining from using sound effects. The composition of the piece reflects the general scientific process from discovery through experimentation to control. We don't know why cell sounds, but we can influence their behavior. And the beauty of these mysterious sounds contrasts the manipulative power of the scientist. The ambivalence between scientific process and aesthetic result and the problematic relationship of scientific knowledge to technological power, especially in cutting edge fields such as nanotechnology, was therefore the thematic focus of the composi compositional progression of the dark side of the cell. And I will play you a little audio excerpt from part four, which is called calming, um, which is a calmer part of the sound. We were able to present this work again several times after the premiere, and each time we increased the size of the sculptural objects. Here's a picture of Andrew and me with our work in Hong Kong. And the last time we showed the installation, we made three gigantic cell sculptures instead of eight small ones. And I will now play you a video excerpt of this showing, uh, 2008 in Hong Kong. One of the projects I have created since I moved to New Zealand is titled Revolve. Revolve is a stage performance that unfolds through storytelling, sound, light, video, and dance, following the path of the sleeper's mind and body through the night. This project arose from an art science workshop held at the Sleep Wake Research Center in Wellington. The workshop was led by Philippa Gander, a chronobiologist, which is the fancy word for sleep scientist, and Sam Truebridge, a sonographer and artist. Six artists and six scientists spent a week together discussing and exploring the specifics of each other's disciplines. And I added some pictures here because I thought it's quite um, adorable. The first thing the artist did is, of course, made the scientists wear their own gear and experience what it's like to be uh, the patient. And there were a lot of experiments and uh, I learned a lot, uh, more than I could tell you today. But I learned about the different uh, stages of sleep and one thing that's quite fascinating is that REM sleep, when we dream, the brain waves look very different to being awake. And when we are in deep sleep, the brain waves, um, all the cells beat together and make these really slow, 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 big pulses. And another thing I learned about in this workshop is the extraordinary importance of light for our circadian rhythm. 
The 24-hour rhythm isn't actually hard-coded into our body, but reset each day through being exposed to daylight. That's why we can travel through time zones and adapt after a phase of jet lag. And it is also why we need daylight in schools and workplaces, otherwise we ne never fully wake up. The 24-hour rotation of the planet is only one of the many influences on, of life on Earth. The 28-day cycle of the moon around the Earth and the 365.25-day cycle of the Earth around the sun have all resulted in many species having endogenous rhythms that lock onto monthly and seasonal cycles in the environment. Organisms that live in the intertidal zone also have complex mechanisms for matching their activity and breeding to the 12.4 hour tidal cycle. And the patterns that lead to the highest and the lowest tides, the so-called neap and king tides, are results of all of these cycles overlapping. And I thought that was very fascinating because it reminded me of the phenomenon, phenomenon of the auditory beat, sometimes also called the binaural beat. Who has heard of the auditory beat? Two, three. Who plays a string instrument? Oh, this is almost the same people, right? So you would know because you need to know about this for tuning, but you might have not heard the term auditory beat. So I'm going to uh, do a little experiment with you so you can experience what that is. It's a fascinating uh, phenomenon when you play two sine tones of very similar frequency you will hear a third beat that actually shouldn't be there. So we will do this test and I hope the volume's about right. So the first thing is I'm going to play you a sine tone of 200 hertz. About like that, right? Simple tone. Now I'll play you a sine tone of 202 hertz. It will sound almost the same to you. Right? And I'm going to play those two tones together and you will hear something else. And that is the beat. And now the beat will be slower or faster depending on the distance between the two tones. So I'll play you 200 hertz and 208 hertz together. Right, so it's faster. Now when you tune your instrument, you want to get rid of that. So when you no longer hear the woo, -woo you know your guitar is in tune. <laughs> so it's a fascinating phenomenon. It's used in, uh, you know, you can get recordings with auditory beats. They claim that they help you sleep better or focus on your work, these kind of things. It's not entirely proven, uh, but there is this thought that you could uh, do brainwave entrain entrainment with these beats. So I use that as an inspiration to the sound design for Revolve. I made this uh, costume for the dancer, which had various sensors so I could read her bo body movements. And I also gave her two light sensors on her wrist. So if she could, if she could manage as a master of the body to hold her wrists to the light and get the same amount of light up both of them, she could evoke these beats in the audience. And um, that was uh, performed in Christchurch. And um, we used very low frequent tones. So they were very physically experiential. So you might been to a club or a place with loud music. You can actually feel the bass in your gut more than you can actually hear it. So that's what we did. Now the thing is, that is very hard to record and to play on a video. So I would like to recommend also because the screen is a bit dark here, that you just go to the website, put on some headphones, and experience the sound and the video uh, that way, because we will just not be getting the same experience here. But it's something that you now know, and you'll, you know, maybe we'll run into again, the auditory beat. So next work. The fourth project I'd like to show you is called Forks in Sockets. It's a collaboration, and it brought together people that are interested in doing strange things with electricity in a cross-disciplinary context. Now, this is a, it's a bit of a change in gears, this one. It tends to be the audience pleaser, we'll see. The following quote from artist Erki Kuraniemi described our goals well. 
The young dissident naturally wanted to play tricks and misuse all technology. That's how electronic music was born. We started making music with devices made for other purposes. Technology won't take control as long as man can misuse it. So in 2012, I got together with engineer Josh Bailey and sonic artist Dougal McKinnon in order to bring musicians and engineers together to perform with and through the Tesla coil. The project grew as an experimental platform for science and art and soon included engineers, contemporary composers, designers and artists. As far as I know, this was the first time uh, ever that composers created original pieces for the Tesla coil, exploring it as a music instrument in its own right. Forks and Sockets was a public performance that took place in the atrium of the School of Design where I work. And for the performance, I created a floating mobile. So let me see if the mouse here, this thingy. And um, that was slowly turning above the coil. And the coil gives off wireless energy. It's a very high powered um, energy. It's, uh, we had to have a, a zone around it that nobody could go in. We called it the death zone. So it's quite some serious electricity that this thing gives off. And through the wireless electricity, it would illuminate the neon um, gas that was in the tube. So there are no electronics or anything going on there. <clears throat> it's a very plain visualizer of the activity of the coil. So the video that um, the, uh, the video designers, the designers created accompanying visuals through generative and performative processes, which we see here. And the musicians composed three very different, absolute unique pieces for the setup. Besides the Tesla coil, we also featured the mech bass. You can see it a little bit here. A mechanical bass built uh, in the School of Engineering that can play faster than any human being. And now I will show you a video that includes an excerpt of each of the three different compositions.
Okay, just some excerpts of that. Again, you can find the, um, all the videos on the website if you're interested further. So I'm almost at the end of my talk. The final project I want to show you is what I'm currently working on, so it's not done yet. Um, but I hope to be able to complete it at the end of this year or beginning of next year. The t project is titled Kihi Kihi and is inspired by New Zealand's chorus cicada. Cicadas are the loudest insects, insects in the world. In New Zealand, the chorus cicada is the most common species and it is renowned for its rhythmic and relentless sonic expression that marks the end of summer. Chorus cicadas are also the biggest ones in New Zealand, averaging about one and a half inches long with a wingspan of about 3.4 inches. The word kihi kihi is Maori and means cicada. It is an onomatopoeic word that sounds might, much like the noise a cicada produces itself. So, ki, 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 like that. Um, I think they're absolutely fascinating creatures, I have to say. So I came to New Zealand in summer and I heard it everywhere and I was like, what is going on? And I noticed that firstly, um, New Zealanders don't necessarily notice because they're so used to it. But also, um, I, I, couldn't, like, I couldn't see them so until somebody told me what it was. And then I started seeing them. And you see them in the city on lampposts. And of course, if you go out into nature, they're everywhere. If you go into um, a forest for about one or two hours, you come out with ringing ears. That is how loud they are. They are really extraordinary creatures. And they've been lurking around in my artistic practice, and I've been meaning to do something about it, but now finally I'm there. So I'll play you some uh, individual cicadas just so you know sort of what they can sound like. Let's see, here's one. Okay. Here's another one. So they do have individual expressions. And then uh, the usual sound cloud you would experience sounds about like this. So the project Kihi Ki is inspired by the chorus cicada, its appearance, sonic expression, and behavior. However, in many ways, it addresses the interrelationship of insects, plants, and humans in general, the ecosystem we all need for survival. While cicadas are not pollinators like bees, they play an important role in the food chain, and they also rely on plants. I'll just show you the the development, so I wanted to create um, an electronic insect. And I started, and I programmed it, and it sounded sort of like what I wanted it to sound. And then um, I worked together with a research assistant, a master's student, to really um, use only the, the technical bits that are needed to create these insects, except you could argue that the wings are not a technical part, so they're the only aesthetic addition to these insects. Here's some more pictures. And in the installation, the audience can activate these electronic insects by placing them on electronic trees. Uh, the audience is invited to explore the sonic, tactile, and visual relationships through play. They can pick up insects, place them on trees, explore placements, and once contact is made, the insect starts glowing and chirping. Each insect has a unique rhythm. Together, the insects form an orchestra their voices blending and interweaving into a polyrhythmic sound cloud. The trees express themselves sonically as well. They emit a noise that sounds a little bit like gentle wind rustling through leaves, and their sound is influenced by the amount of insects that are attached to them. Um, so I will now show you a video of my current work in progress. Again, it's not done. I think the insects, they're gonna stay quite similar. We're gonna make them a bit louder. But the trees, I'm not entirely happy with yet. We'll see, we'll see how that works out. Um, and yes, I'll, first I'll play you the video so you know what I'm actually talking about. 
So this is an image, here we go. So while the interaction is playful, this participatory installation hopefully provokes contemplation on the deeper interwovenness of our natural environment and the importance of insects to human survival. Robot insects are already being developed to replace natural pollinators in the food industry. If the worldwide insect decline continues at its rapid rate, will artificial insects be all that we have left? Beyond their usefulness to the ec ecosystem, what are we losing culturally and emotionally? Who will sing for us in summer? So I've brought, I've brought one little friend. He's been, or she? No, he, no, it's a he. That's only the male sing. He's been all over Europe. So um, one of the magnets has already dropped out. But uh, I'll I'll pass it around. Um, there we go. No working. It's just one. And I would just like to finish this talk. Uh, thank you for your time and leave you with a question. What is a noisy sound in your life? And can you find poetry in it? Thank you very much. <laughs>